Hello and welcome to our second day coverage from Lisbon Web Summit. I'm your host Jonathan Openshaw and I'm very pleased to be joined by Ben Goetzel, who's a man of many talents, um, but uh, one, of, one of them is Chief Data Scientist at Hanson Robotics um, and he also is founder of Singularity Net, um, so we're here to chat about a couple of them. Um, but I guess with your first hat on, thinking about the kind of, you know, people know you for Sophia and for Hanson, um, what, it's interesting with robotics, it feels like robots have been something humans have always loved to think about. It's something that our kind of imaginations have <coughs> run way ahead of us. And in some ways, the technology kind of has been slower to catch up, but now it feels like we're kind of at a tipping point. Do you think that, you know, finally, it's not something that's just nice to think about. This is really, you know, 2019, we're, we're kind of there now. I mean, robots, broadly speaking, are having a big economic impact on the world right now. China is robotizing one factory after another. But I think Hanson Robotics, of which I'm the chief scientist, so it's a heavily biased opinion. But I mean, I think Hanson Robotics is poised to make a breakthrough to get humanoid robots, you know, really rolled out very, very widely in you know, in all sorts of commercial functions, then as home service robots. And, you know, at Hanson Robotics, we're working with the factories in, in Shenzhen in South China on how to scale up manufacturers. So you can have huge numbers of Sophia-like robots all over the world. Then on the cognitive side, which is my main focus, I, I led the software team developing the software behind Sophia and the Hanson robots. On, on the cognitive side, you know, our Singularity Net platform, which is, is this blockchain-based AI compute cloud that lets anyone put AI into the cloud and all the AIs in this mind cloud can talk to each other and enhance each other's intelligence. I think with this kind of approach, once you've scaled up the manufacturing and have millions or hundreds of millions or billions of robots out there, all their knowledge goes into this, you know, Singularity Net AI mind cloud, which makes the robots smarter and smarter. So then you then you get the kind of network effects and scale effects that, that, that we're seeing in so many other areas of the internet economy. And I know you probably get this question a lot, but when you're talking about things like humanoid robots and you talk about things like the singularity, I think for like a lot of lay people, it's, it kind of contains a bit of like threat. People get a bit scared about it. It's this kind of sci-fi vision we have of kind of Skynet and we're all gonna be enslaved. Like what, like what do yeah, you say we, to those we, we almost named our company Skynet, but someone had the URL, so we had to go with SingularityNet instead, right? Yeah. So what, so what would you say, uh, you know, pe people, people are um, amb like, uh, they, they have ambiguous feelings to say the least about it. What do you, you you've got a very positive well, vision. What do you kind of say to I mean, technology, always has pluses and minuses and I mean people have ambiguous feelings about their phones also but they don't stop using them and I think the same is true with AIs and robots people like to be afraid and they like to torment themselves in, in, in confusion sometimes but when you give them something really useful they're gonna use it so I mean if you put a home service robot in everyone's home that takes care of grandma watches the baby clean cleans the dishes cleans the house and remembers all your appointments for you, people are going to use that home service robot. It's going to give them a lot of value, just like everyone uses their smartphone right now. So, I mean, I think people's unease with new things is just part of human psychology. But in, in the end, we're providing valuable services to people, and that, 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 that's what's going to carry the day. And I guess with any human technology, you know, since the kind of the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, or whatever, there's a sense that it, either, either it can be an evolution or a revolution. It's a kind of creep or it's sudden and overnight. How do you foresee kind of, you know, well, artificial intelligence? It, it, it's a revolution, but it can feel like an evolution from the inside. I mean, I think in my best projection within the next, say, five to 30 years, we're gonna get AIs that are much smarter than people. And, you know, on the one hand, that's really, really fast on the historical time scale, right? <clears throat> on the other hand, it's going to be week by week, month by month, step, step by step, right? I mean, in, in the same way, I mean, the miniaturization of phones has been very fast on a historical time scale, <clears throat> but it's been step by step for me. I get a new phone every year and, and it's more powerful, right? So, yeah, we're in the middle of an AI revolution and we're in the early stages of the technological singularity right right now, uh, actually. Like when, when our AI mind children look back on this, 
they're going to see that right now we were we were just right right in the, in the th in the thick of it. So, okay. and with you've mentioned the singularity a couple of times now, and I feel like you know robots, humanoid robots especially, it's something that many people are familiar with. The singularity maybe feels like a bit more of a leap. Can you kind of explain sure. it really in a kind of, yes. Yeah, the concept of the technological singularity is a point in time at which the rate of invention and innovation and technological change becomes so fast to a human being it seems almost infinite. So imagine like an AI makes a new Nobel Prize winning discovery every second. There's a new amazing invention every every nanosecond or something, right? That's so fast the human mind couldn't keep up. And what would come with AI on that level is a whole lot of other things like molecular nanotechnology, which lets you build with molecules and atoms like we like a child now builds with Legos, or the ability of nanotechnology to repair damage with the human body, which will give human immortality, right? And so of course there's going to be limitations to any new technology and we can't see what the limitations are now of future technology any more than like a caveman could see what the limitations of the internet were, were going to be but we're talking about a level of abundance and technological fluidity far beyond anything around today the amazing thing about exponential change is something like this could happen in you know five twenty thirty years rather than like a thousand years from now or something and this is driven by the exponential change of Moore's law of computer capacity exponential improvements in networking in in biological imaging all these things are increasing not linearly but exponentially and this can drive exponential change in artificial intelligence and then a related concept to the singularity is what I.J. Good a mathematician in 1965 called the intelligence explosion what he said is the first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention humanity needs to make. And so this is really the sea change. Once it's AIs who are designing the new technologies, starting the new companies and making the new scientific discoveries, I mean, then you're into a whole different domain, right? And we're pretty, on the historical scale, we're pretty close to that now. Like, I, I could be wrong, of course. I believe that with the work we're doing with SingularityNet and with our OpenCog AI platform, I think we have the ideas needed to make this happen. I mean, there's years more of R&D work to fully realize this, but you know, I've been doing AI for 30 years and we're definitely seeing things go much faster in the last few years than, than we ever did before. Like you, you can feel the exponential improvement. That sense of a kind of tipping point, I guess. Absolutely, there is. So, yeah. just fi final question. So, the, you know, this is super exciting, the technology in abstract, but then I guess bringing it back to kind of pe people's lives, our lives, it's going to be, you know, if this happens, it will be incredibly disruptive, transformative, yeah. you know, for good and for bad, and maybe just focusing on things that people understand, like, you know, uh, their work or we're here with BMW so automotives or whatever how how does this kind how would this tipping point totally change our I mean for, for automobiles I think the world has already understood the implication I mean and that's been an amazing change in public understanding and attitude because in in 2012 or 13 most people would tell you self-driving cars are many decades away then you had the 2015 DARPA Grand Challenge for driving. You know, now 2018, all of a sudden, it's obvious to everyone that self-driving cars are going to be, you know, the next big thing. And then you can have sort of an AI in-car concierge, which is talking to you and carrying out services for you, operating the car and being a personal assistant while you're in the car. And I mean, that's that's almost not even interesting to talk about as a futurist guru because everyone accepts it already but on the other hand it wasn't very long ago when this was the province of like starry-eyed science fiction freaks only right I mean I think there's gonna be other amazing changes that go far beyond that but that 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 one is clearly coming in let's say five five to ten years and you know my great-grandchildren will uh, maybe even my grandchildren i don't know I, I have a grandchild already but we'll look back and they will be really weirded out that we drove our own cars just like now we look back we're weirded out people used to make all their own clothes right 
I mean, my great grandparents sewed their own clothes together. We don't do that now, you know, and in 10 years, you won't drive your own car unless it's, it's a fetish, like an F1 race car driver or, 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 or something. Then, I mean, there, there's a lot of other things that will, that will follow on, on from that because once you have a self-driving car, people are freed up from having to be a vehicle operator all the time, right? And that will just be part of a great freeing up of people from tedious things. Like pe many people think it's bad that AIs and robots will eliminate the need to work for a living, but I, I think that's very much a feature and not a bug. Like when robots and AIs can carry out material production, I mean, people will be free to pursue intellectual pursuits, social pursuits, spiritual pursuits, go, go hiking in the woods, learn to play a new instrument, make a new invention just for the fun of it, right? I mean, again, my great-grandchildren will look back and they will be perplexed and amazed that you had to, s at one point humans had to spend most of their waking hours just carrying out repetitive activities to get basic resources for life. Like that, that will be looked back on with bizarreness and disgust, like we now look back on doing surgical operations without anesthetic. Ben, that's super fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with sure. us. And make sure you tune into the rest of our coverage by following hashtag your summit.